Section 1 of the Communatory of St. Vincent Lorraine. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Communatory of St. Vincent Lorraine. Translated by Rev. J. Shanahan. Preface. St. Vincent was of a Gaulish extraction, had a polite education, was for some time a military officer, and lived with dignity in society. He informs us in his prologue that having been some time tossed about in the storms of a bustling military life, he began seriously to consider the dangers with which he was surrounded and the vanity and folly of his pursuits. He desired to take shelter in the harbor of religion, which he calls the safest refuge from the world. His view in this resolution was that he might strenuously labor to divest his soul of its ruffling passions of pride and vanity, and to offer to God the acceptable sacrifice of a humble and Christian spirit, and that being farther removed from worldly temptations, he might endeavor more easily to avoid not only the wrecks of the present life, but also the burnings of that to come. In these dispositions he retired from the crowds of cities, and made for the desired harbor with all the sail he could. The place he chose for his retirement was a small island sheltered from the noise of the world. This Gennadius assures to have been the famous monastery of Lorraine, situated in the lesser of two agreeable islands, which formerly bore the name of Lorraine, not far from the coast of Lower Province toward Antibes. In this place he shut himself up that he might attend solely to what God commands us, and to study to know him. He considered that true faith is necessary to salvation, no less than morality, and that the former is the foundation of Christian virtue, and he grieved to see the church at that time pestered with numberless heresies, which sucked their poison from the very antidote, the holy scriptures, and which by various wiles spread on every side their dangerous snares. To guard the faithful against the false and perplexing glosses of modern subtle refiners, and to open the eyes of those who had been already seduced by them, he, with great clearness, eloquence, and force of reasoning, wrote a book which he entitled A Commonatory Against Heretics, which he composed A.D. 434, three years after the General Council of Ephesus had condemned the Nestorians. He had chiefly in view the heretics of his own times, especially the Nestorians and Apollinarists, but he confuted them by general clear principles which overturn all heresies to the end of the world. Together with the ornaments of eloquence and erudition, the inward beauty of his mind and the brightness of his devotion sparkle in every page of his book. He lays down this rule in which all Catholic pastors and the ancient fathers agree that such is truly Catholic doctrine whatever hath been believed in all places, at all times, and by all the faithful. By this test of Catholicity, antiquity, and consent, he says all controverted points in belief must be tried. He shows that whilst Novation, Photonus, Sibelius, etc., expound the divine oracles different ways, to avoid the perplexity of errors, we must interpret the Holy Scriptures by the tradition of the Catholic Church as the clue to conduct in the truth. The saint adds that if a doubt arises in interpreting the meaning of the scriptures in any point of faith, we must summon in the holy fathers who have lived and died in the faith and communion of the Catholic Church, and by this test we shall prove the false doctrine to be novel. For that only we must look upon as indubitably certain and unalterable, which all or the major part of these fathers have delivered, like the harmonious consent of a general council. But if any one among them, be he ever so holy, ever so learned, holds anything besides or in opposition to the rest, that is to be placed in the rank of singular and private opinions, and never to be looked upon as the public general authoritative doctrine of the Church. After a point has been decided in general counsel, the definition is irrefragable. St. Vincent remarks that souls which have lost the anchorage of the Catholic faith are tossed and shattered with inward storms of clashing thoughts that by this restless posture of mind they may be sensible of their dangers, and taking down the sails of pride and vanity which they have unhappily spread before every gust of heresy, they may make all the sail they can into the safe and peaceful harbor of this holy mother, the Catholic Church. 
and being sick from a surfeit of errors, they may there discharge those foul and bitter waters to make room for the pure waters of life. There they may unlearn well what they had learned ill, may get a right notion of all those doctrines of the church they are capable of understanding, and believe those that surpass all understanding. Chapter 20 As St. Vincent had grounded his rule of faith upon these three principles, first the Holy Bible, second tradition, third the definitions or decrees of general councils, so is it proper to premise a few remarks respecting these important points. For nothing can strengthen us more in the Catholic faith, nor draw from the Protestant an avowal of the novelty of his opinions on religion, than the perfect conformity that exists between the belief of Catholics now and in the fifth century when St. Vincent lived. But in order to show this conformity of the Catholic Church in all ages, nothing must be adduced but what all Catholics hold as articles of faith. Now, on the one hand, St. Vincent, on the scripture, tradition, decrees, and definitions of general council as the rule of faith in the 5th century, held by the then-living Catholics, so, on the other hand, Bossuet, with whom all Catholics agree in his exposition, says, Christ Jesus laid the foundation of his church upon the authority of preaching, and the consequence, therefore, is that the unwritten word was the first rule of Christianity a rule which, ever when the books of the New Testament were superadded to it, did not, upon this account, lose any share of its former authority. For this reason it is, that we receive with an equal degree of veneration whatever has been taught by the apostles, whether this were communicated by writing or inculculated only by the word of mouth, according to the express declaration of St. Paul to the Thessalonians, commanding them to hold fast the traditions which they had been taught whether by word or by epistle. Second Thessalonians 2.15 and 3.6 2 Timothy 1.13 and 2.2 There cannot indeed exist a sign more indisputably certain that any particular doctrine derives its origin and has descended down to us from the apostles than when it has been embraced by all the churches of the Christian world without the possibility of pointing out any fixed period of its introduction. We cannot help receiving whatever is established in this manner. We do it even with that willing submission which is due, we feel, to the divine authority. Indeed, I am convinced that the Protestants themselves, where their reason is not warped and rendered obstinate by prejudice, entertain at the bottom of their hearts the very same opinion. For it is impossible to imagine that any tenet which has been admitted since the dawn of Christianity itself could really have derived its origin from any other source than of the apostles. Hence the Protestant ought not to be astonished at the Catholic Church, careful to collect and retain whatever our forefathers have bequeathed unto us, preserves with veneration the holy depositum of tradition, just as with piety she reveres the sacred treasures of the holy scriptures. The Church has been, says Bossuet, established by the power and wisdom of its sacred author, in order to be the guide of Christian faith, the director of Christian piety, the guardian of the scriptures, and the preserver of tradition. We therefore receive from her hands these holy writings which we revere as canonical. I am convinced, even spite of the contrary assertion, that it is her authority chiefly that induces the Protestant himself to receive as inspired several portions of the holy volumes. It is hence that he admits as divine the Canticle of Canticles, or Song of Solomon, which in fact possesses hardly any of the intrinsic marks of inspiration. Hence that he respects the Epistle of St. James, which Luther rejects as spurious. Hence that he reveres the Epistle of St. Jude, whose authority, on account of certain apocryphal books which are quoted in it, might to many appear spurious. But in short it is not, it cannot be upon any other authority in reality, that the Protestant receives as inspired the whole body of sacred scriptures, for it is his custom to revere these even before their perusal has convinced him that the Spirit of God is infused into them. Attached, therefore, as we inseparably are to the holy authority of the Church by the means of the scriptures which we receive from her hand, we learn from her also the doctrines of tradition, and by means of tradition the genuine sense of the sacred pages. It is for this reason that the Church professes to teach nothing as from herself, or to invent any new article of belief. What alone she does is under the influence and direction of the Holy Ghost, 
simply to declare the divine revelation, and after having declared, to follow it. And that the Holy Ghost does really explain himself by the mouth of the Church, of this we have positive evidence on the occasion of the dispute, which in the time of the Apostles took place respecting the ceremonies of the law. The acts of these founders of our Holy Institute in the decision of this important controversy form a record which instructs all seceding ages, where that authority resides by which all religious differences ought always to be determined, so that whatever dispute shall unhappily occur to divide the faithful, the Church upon such an occasion will always interfere with her authority, and her pastors convened in council will always, in imitation of the apostles, say, It hath seemed good to the Holy Ghost and to us. Acts 15. When she has spoken in this manner, Then shall her children be instructed and made to understand that now it is no longer theirs to examine anew the articles which have been thus decided, but in humble acquiescence to submit to her decrees. This is merely imitating the example of St. Paul and Silas, who when they carried to the faithful the first ordinance of the apostles, so far from allowing them any fresh discussion of the point which had been decided, they on the contrary went through the provinces, teaching all to observe the decrees of the apostles. Acts 16, verse 4. Thus it is that the true children of God, with humble acquiescence, submit their judgment to the wiser judgment of the church, convinced that by her mouth they here delivered to them the oracles of the Holy Ghost. It is in consequence of this conviction that after having said in the creed, I believe in the Holy Ghost, we immediately add, and in the Holy Catholic Church, trying ourselves by these words to acknowledge that the depositum of truth is in the universal church preserved forever, unfailing, perpetual, and entire. Indeed, this church, which we reverence as perpetual, would cease to be a church did she once cease to teach the genuine truths of revelation, so that the individuals who think or are apprehensive that she will abuse her authority for the purpose of propagating error do not in reality possess that faith which they ought to do in that divine spirit by whom that sacred institution is directed. And let the Protestant consider objects in a merely human point of view. He will even in this case be reduced to acknowledge that the Catholic Church, so far from endeavoring as her adversaries often assert she does, to tyrannize over the belief of her members, she, on the contrary, has employed every expedient possible to bind herself and to deprive herself of the means of introducing innovations. For these ends, not only does she submit to the sacred scripture in order to stay or forever banish any arbitrary interpretations which cause sometimes the thoughts of men to pass for scriptures, she ties herself moreover to interpret and understand whatever belongs to faith and morals according to the interpretation and sense of the Holy Fathers. She declares in all her counsels as well as in all her professions and instruments of faith, that she does not receive any article of belief which is not exactly conformable to the tradition and faith of every preceding century. Men may reason as they please, but it is true that if the Protestant would only consult the dictates of his own conscience, he would find that, after all, the word church possesses a much greater influence over him than in his disputes with us he is willing to admit. I do not, for my own part, believe that in the whole Protestant community there is a single individual who, if he be possessed of good sense, would not tremble at the prospect of seeing himself stand alone in the profession of any peculiar opinion, although even such opinion might to him appear well-founded. So true it is that on a subject so vitally important as that of religion, men to be contentedly confident in their own sentiments require the sanction, moreover, of some society which thinks and believes as they do. It is upon this account that the being who created us and who knows what best suits our circumstances has, for our greater benefit and happiness, decreed that each individual among the faithful shall be subject to the authority of the Church, an authority which, for this reason, is established the most forcibly of all others. In reality, the authority of the Church is established not only by the testimony which God himself has furnished in its favor in the sacred scriptures, but by a great variety of sensible attestations, also which point out in the most striking manner that with a tender providence he still watches over the holy institution. The proofs of this may be distinctly traced 
not less in its inviolable and perennial duration than in its wonderful and miraculous propagation. Let then the candid and sincere attentively compare the exposition of the rule of Catholic faith with that of St. Vincent throughout the whole of the following golden comminatory. And they cannot fail of acknowledging the perfect conformity between the faith of Catholics now and in the fifth century, and must confess that the Catholic faith is always the same. For whilst error is always changing, the truth is always unchangeable. End of section 1. Section 2 of the Comminatory of St. Vincent Lorin, translated by Rev. J. Shanahan. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Section 2. Preface. The Comminatory of St. Vincent Lorin. This treatise of Peregrinus, a name assumed by St. Vincent, supports the antiquity and universality of the Catholic Church against the profane innovations of all heretics. Preface. The author's reason and design for undertaking the work. Whilst the scriptures speak and admonish us, ask thy fathers and they will tell thee, thy elders and they will declare to thee, Deuteronomy 32 7, and also incline thy ear and hear the words of the wise, Proverbs 22 17. I, Peregrine, the least of all the servants of God, am inclined to believe that with the help of God it may be attended with some good if I would commit to writing what I have learned faithfully from the Holy Fathers. It shall be very beneficial, at least to my own infirmity, as I shall always have at hand, whereby the frailty of my memory may be repaired by daily reading. And it is not only the utility of the work induces me to undertake it, but also the consideration of time and the commodiousness of the place. Time excites me to undertake it. For as time snatches away all that is dear to man in this world, so also ought we to snatch something from time that may profit to eternal life. And the more especially now, when both the dreadful expectation of the divine judgment just approaching pressingly demands an increase of zeal for religion, and also the artifice of modern heretics calls for our utmost care and attention, the place invites me to undertake this work, because having retired from the crowd and bustle of cities, we live in the cloisters of a monastery in an obscure village where I am able without distraction to practice that of the psalmist. Be still, and see that I am God. Deuteronomy 45.11 Moreover, the monastic life I now profess is compatible with my intention, whereas hitherto I have been tossed about in various and sorrowful confusion of a military life. But now, at length, I have, with the blessing of Christ, arrived at the harbor of religion, always most safe for all, that here, having divested my soul of the ruffling passions of vanity and pride and appeasing God by the sacrifice of humility, I can avoid not only the shipwreck of the present life, but also the burning of that to come. But now I shall begin the work in the name of the Lord that is to transcribe what has been handed down by the fathers and deposited in our hands with all the fidelity of a relator rather than the presumption of an author. This shall be the plan of my writing, to touch upon nothing but what is necessary, and that too not in a beautiful and correct style, but in the plain common way of expression, so that the subjects may be sufficiently understood rather than perfectly expressed. Men who are confident of their own brightness or are professors of eloquence may write in fine figures and accuracy of style. I shall content myself with preparing for my own use this comminatory to assist my recollection or rather my forgetfulness, which, however, by recollecting what I have learned, I will endeavor by degrees to make correct and perfect. I have, therefore, mentioned this to the end that should it chance to get from me and fall into the hands of the saints, they should not rashly censor it, as the author pledges himself to correct and polish it more completely. End of section 2 Section 3 of the Comminatory of St. Vincent Lorin, translated by Rev. J. Shanahan. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter 1 The Holy Scriptures and the tradition of the Catholic Church is the only true and sure rule of faith. Therefore, with the greatest attention and desire, inquiring of many men, excelling in piety and sound doctrine how I could acquire true knowledge, 
by which, and as it were, by a general and regular rule, I could distinguish the truth of the Catholic faith from the falsity of heretical pravity. I received this answer generally from them all, that if I or any other would wish to discover the frauds of rising heretics and avoid their snares and to continue sound and entire in sound faith, he must, with the Lord's assistance, strengthen his faith by a twofold rule, that is, first, by the authority of the divine law, and secondly, by the tradition of the Catholic Church. But here perhaps a man may ask, since the canon of the Scriptures is perfect, and more than sufficient in every respect, what need is there that the authority of ecclesiastical intelligence be added thereto? Because all do not understand the Scripture in one and the same sense, on account of its sublimity. But one expounds its divine oracles after this fashion, and another after that, insomuch that as many opinions seem could be drawn from it, as there are interpreters. For Novation interprets the Scripture one way, Sibelius another way, Donatus expounds it this way, Arius another, Eunomius, Macedonius, other ways, Cotinius, Apollinaris, Priscillianus, another way, Jovianus, Pelagius, Callistius, another way, and in fine, Macedonius interprets it in a different sense. And therefore, in such perplexity of various errors, it is extremely necessary that the line of prophetical and apostolical interpretation be drawn according to the scale of the ecclesiastical and Catholic sense. Likewise, we who are in the bosom of the Catholic Church must be very cautious that we hold what has been believed in all places, in all times, and by all the faithful. Besides that alone is truly and properly Catholic, which comprehends all these as it appears from the very sense and meaning of the word. In short, by this we are Catholic, if we follow universality, antiquity, and unanimous consent. Now we follow universality when we confess that to be the one true faith, which the whole church throughout the whole world professes. In like manner, we follow antiquity when we do not deviate from that sense of Scripture to which the Holy Fathers and our predecessors adhered. And finally, we follow consent if we follow the definitions and opinions of all, or almost all as well, bishops as doctors in the ancient. End of section 3section 4 of the communitory of st vincent lorin translated by rev j shanahan this librivox recording is in the public domain chapter 2 in case of schism what guide are we to follow what therefore shall the orthodox catholic do if any small part of the church separate itself from the communion of the catholic faith why truly he must prefer the sound body of the catholic church before a rotten and infectious member. But if some new contagion would endeavor to sully, not a small portion only, but likewise the whole church, what is to be done? Even then, we must closely adhere to antiquity, which cannot altogether be seduced by any fraud of novelty. But if, among the ancients, we find one or two or three men, nay a city or an entire province in error, then we must be careful to prefer the decrees of some general council, if any such be, to the rashness or ignorance of the few. But if a case of this kind occur, where a decree of a general council cannot be had, why then we must make it our business to consult and learn what were the judgments of our predecessors, and compare them together. Those authors alone are to be consulted who, although they lived in diverse times and places, yet persevering in the faith and communion of the one Catholic Church, and are approved teachers and worthy of credit, and whatever we find that not one or two only, but all the fathers unanimously, clearly, commonly, and constantly had held, written, and taught, that we must understand we are to believe without doubt. End of section 4 Section 5 of the Communitory of St. Vincent Lorin Translated by Rev. J. Shanahan. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter 3. Examples to illustrate the principle of the foregoing chapter. 
But to make more intelligible what I have already laid down, I shall explain each rule by examples and illustrate them more particularly, lest through an overfond desire of too much brevity the great importance of the subject be slightly passed over in this cursory way of writing. In the time of Donatus, whose followers called themselves Donatists, when a great part of Africa plunged themselves into the fanaticism of his error, and when, no longer mindful of the name Catholic, of religion, or of profession, they preferred the sacrilegious temerity of one man to the Church of Christ, then those in Africa, having detested that profane schism, united themselves in communion with all the churches in the world. Those alone of all the Africas could be saved who remained within the sanctuary of the Catholic faith, leaving, therefore, a striking example to posterity, that according to this laudable practice, the sound doctrine of the Catholics should be preferred to the fanaticism of one or even a few. Also, when the poison of the Arians had contaminated not a small portion, but almost the whole world, so that a kind of delusive mist was spread over the minds of almost all the Latin bishops, who were deceived partly by force and partly by fraud, insomuch that in such confusion of things it was extremely difficult to know what chiefly to follow. Then every true lover and worshipper of Christ was free from the least stain of that contagion by preferring the ancient faith to the new perfidious doctrine. From the misfortunes of this time it is more than manifest what a torrent of calamities is brought in upon mankind by the introduction of new and false doctrines. By its means matters, not trifling only, but even the most important, are shaken to their center and fall to nothing. Not only affinities, relations, friends, and families, but also cities, peoples, provinces, nations, in fine, the whole Roman Empire, is thereby distracted and divided against itself. For when the profane novelty of the Arians, like unto a Bologna or direful monster, having first of all taken possession of the emperor's heart, and next brought under its control and new laws all the principal men in the palace, afterwards it did not cease until it brought all things into confusion, without distinction, of what was private or public, sacred or profane, without respect for truth or virtue, but from the protection of the court, as if from the advantage of an eminence, it forced under its diction whatsoever it pleased. Then wives were violated, widows unveiled, virgins profaned, monasteries demolished, the clergy disturbed, the Levites beaten, priests driven into exile, workhouses filled with saints, as also the prisons, the mines crammed with the faithful, the greater part of whom were interdicted, the cities cast out and banished, worn out and consumed with hunger, thirst, and nakedness among caverns, rocks, and deserts, and wild beasts. But all these calamities have no other cause than because, instead of heavenly doctrine, human superstitions are introduced, because well-founded antiquity is destroyed by wicked novelty, because the institutions of superiors are violated, because the decrees of the fathers are annulled, because the things defined by our predecessors are trampled upon, in short, because a passion for profane novelties and curiosity does not restrain itself with the most chaste limits of sacred uncorrupted antiquity. End of section 5 Section 6 of the Communitory of St. Vincent Lorin Translated by Rev. J. Shanahan This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter 4 The Persecution from the Arians Confirmed by St. Ambrose Feasts of the Martyrs and Confessors. To avoid heresy, we must follow counsels, etc., of the Catholic Church. But perhaps someone will say that I have been thus led through aversion for novelty and veneration for antiquity. Whosoever judges so, if he believe not my word, at least let him believe the blessed Ambrose, who in his second book to the Emperor Gratian, deploring the bitterness of his times, says, but now, O Almighty God, after so many misfortunes of ours, after so much blood of ours being spilled, we have sufficiently atoned for the death of the confessors, the exile of the priests, and the wickedness of so great an impiety. Thou hast made it most clear that those who have violated thy faith cannot be long in security. Book 2 of Defide, Chapter 4 
Also, in the third book of the same work, he says, Let us therefore keep the precepts of our predecessors, nor let us rashly presume to violate the hereditary marks of our belief. Neither the ancients, nor the powers, nor angels, nor archangels dared to open that prophetic book that was sealed, Apocalypse 5. The prerogative of loosing its seals and opening it was reserved for Christ alone. And who amongst us can presume to open the seals of that sacerdotal book, sealed by the confessors, and already consecrated by the martyrdom of many? Those who were by force constrained to unseal that sacred volume afterwards sealed it by reprobating the fraud by which they were deceived. Those who could not be prevailed upon to violate that book became confessors and martyrs. How can we deny the faith of those whose victory we celebrate? We celebrate them indeed, yes, Venerable Ambrose, we celebrate them indeed, and with unmixed praise we admire them. Who can be so unwise as not to desire earnestly to follow them, though he cannot arrive at their perfection, whom no kind of violence could deter from defending the faith of their predecessors, upon whom neither threats nor caresses nor life nor death nor palace nor guards nor emperor nor empire nor men nor devils could prevail, whom I say from their adherence to the true old religion, the Lord himself judged worthy of so much merit that through them he had restored the churches that were in ruins, renewed the spirit of religion, almost extinct among the people, replaced the mitres of the bishops which were taken away from them, wiped away not the letters but those nefarious stains of new impiety in a fountain of tears, which the bishops of the faithful shed through the inspiration of heaven in fine through whom God recalled almost the whole world attacked by a sudden storm of a new and unexpected heresy, from novel impiety to its ancient faith, from strange fanaticism to its ancient sound doctrine, and from the blindness of novelty to its former splendor. But in this divine virtue of the confessors, this must be made a subject of our most serious consideration, that in the primitive days of the Church, the defense of the universal church and not of a particular part was supported by the fathers. Nor was it becoming such and so venerable men to write whole volumes in confuting the erroneous and self-contradictory opinions of one or two men, or even to contend in behalf of a rash combination of a petty province. But closely following the decrees and definitions of all the bishops of the Holy Church, the heirs of apostolical and Catholic faith, they preferred to expose themselves to death than betray the faith of the ancient Catholic Church. Wherefore they had merited to have arrived at such glory that they are justly and meritoriously esteemed, not only confessors, but even the princes of confessors. End of section 6 Section 7 of the Communitory of St. Vincent Lorin, translated by Rev. J. Shanahan. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter 5 The Apostolical Sea of Rome, Always the Source of Sound Faith and Doctrine The great example, therefore, of those saints, an example truly divine and by constant meditation ought to be reflected upon by every true Catholic. Those saints shining with the sevenfold light of the Holy Ghost, as the candlestick with its seven branches, have transmitted to posterity the most brilliant formula, whereby the boldness of profane novelty, together with all the empty boasts of heresy, can be crushed by the authority of venerable antiquity. Nor is this indeed anything new, for truly this custom always prevailed in the Church, that the more religious a man was, the more prompt he opposed novel inventions. Everything is full of examples of this kind. But to avoid prolixity, I will select one example, and that too from the Apostolic See, that all may most clearly see with what power, zeal, and argument the blessed succession of the blessed apostles mainlined the integrity of the religion once received. For therefore Agrippinus of venerable memory, Bishop of Carthage, 
was the first of all men who was an advocate for rebaptization against the canon of Scripture, against the practice of the Catholic Church, against the sentiments of all bishops, against the custom and decrees of our predecessors in the faith. This presumption of his carried along with it so much evil that it not only gave the heretics a precedent of sacrilegiously rebaptizing the Catholics, but it proved an occasion of error to some Catholics. When, therefore, all cried out against the novelty, and all the bishops everywhere opposed it in proportion to everyone's zeal, then Pope Stephen of blessed memory, bishop of the Apostolic See, stood up with his other colleagues against it. But he, in a signal matter above the rest, thinking it fitting, I believe, that he should excel them as much by the ardor of his faith as he was raised above them by the authority of his see, in his letter to the Church of Africa thus decrees, Let no innovation be introduced, but let that be observed which is handed down to us by tradition. The prudent and holy man understood that the rule of piety admits nothing new, but that all things are to be delivered down to posterity with the same fidelity with which they were received, and that it is our duty to follow religion and not to make religion follow us. For the proper characteristic of a modest and sober Christian is not to impose his own conceits upon posterity, but to make his own imagination bend to the wisdom of those that went before him. What, then, was the issue of this grand affair but that which is usual? Antiquity kept possession, and novelty was exploded. But some may object that this newly invented doctrine was supported by many patrons. Nay, to support this point, never was such strength of genius nor greater flow of eloquence displayed, or greater number of patrons, or more likeness of truth, or such authorities of holy writ, but understood in quite a new fashion, so that it appeared to me impossible that such a powerful combination could be overturned by any means. Notwithstanding the great support of this cause, advanced and befriended as it had been, the very appearance of its novelty brought it to ruin. In fine, what was the influence of that African council? Through the divine assistance, it was nothing for all its proceedings became abolished, antiquated, and despised, like to a dream or a fable, as if superfluous. And, O oh, strange turn of things, the authors of the same opinions are declared Catholics, and the followers of it are declared heretics. The masters are absolved, and the disciples are condemned. The writers of the books will be the children of the heavenly kingdom, whilst their defenders will be fuel for hellfire. For who is so unwise as to doubt that the most blessed Cyprian, that brilliant light of all the saints, both bishops and martyrs, will reign forever with Christ together with his other colleagues? And on the other hand, who is so sacrilegious as to deny that the Donatists and other pests of the church, who boast the authority of that council in defense of rebaptization, will burn forever with the devil in merciless flames? End of section 7. Section 8 of the Communitory of St. Vincent Lorin, translated by Rev. J. Shanahan. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter 6 Frauds of Heretics. Indeed, I think this to be the just judgment of God against them on account of the fraud especially of those who, after setting their brains at work to forge a heresy, and under the specious name of another, take up generally the most obtruse and difficult passages of some ancient writer, and which, by reason of their obscurity, they would feign to be conformable to their own conceits, so that whatever be the dogma they produce, they themselves may not seem to be the first nor only inventors thereof which impiety of theirs I judge worthy of a twofold hatred. First, because they are not afraid to infuse the poison of heresy into the hearts of others. And secondly, by their sacrilegious hands, they violate the memory of any holy man and disturb as it were the ashes of the dead. And with profane tongues, 
They slanderously circulate what should be buried in eternal oblivion, following the footsteps of their author Cham, who not only neglected to cover the nakedness of venerable Noah, but told it to others that he may be mocked at. Wherefore, having so heinously sinned against piety, he merited a prophetic curse that was entailed on him and even on his posterity. He was far different in disposition from his brothers, who would neither defile their own eyes with their revered father's nakedness, nor expose his shame to others. But as it is written, they, going backwards, covered him which is a proof they neither had approved nor exposed the fault of the holy man, and therefore they and their posterity received a blessing. But to return to my subject, therefore of all things to be dreaded, we should most cautiously beware not to incur the punishment of those who make alterations in faith and innovations in religion, from which punishment not only the discipline of ecclesiastical constitutions, but also the censor of the apostolic authority ought to deter us. All know how strongly, severely, and vehemently St. Paul inveighs against those who, with astonishing levity, removed themselves from him, who called them to the grace of Christ, to another gospel, which is not another, Galatians 1, who heaped to themselves teachers according to their own desires, turning away their hearing from the truth, being turned to fables, having damnation because they have made void their first faith, 2 Timothy 4, because they were deceived by those whom the same apostle to his Roman brethren describes. Now I beseech you, brethren, to mark them that cause dissensions and offenses contrary to the doctrine which you have learned, and avoid them. For they that are such serve not Christ our Lord but their own belly, and by pleasing speeches and good words seduce the hearts of the innocent, Romans 16:17, who creep into houses and lead captive silly women, loaden with sins, who are led away with diverse desires, always learning and never attaining to the knowledge of truth, 2 Timothy 3, 6. Vain talkers and seducers who subvert whole houses, teaching things which they ought not for filthy lucre's sake, Titus 1.11. Men corrupted in mind reprobate as to the faith, 2 Timothy 3. Proud, knowing nothing, but sick about questions and strifes of words, who are destitute of the truth, esteeming gain to be piety, and with all being idle they learn to go about from house to house, and not only idle, but tattlers also, and inquisitive, speaking things which they ought not. 1 Timothy 5 Rejecting a good conscience, they have made a shipwreck concerning their faith. 1 Timothy 1 Whose profane speeches spread like a cancer, and grow much towards impiety. 2 Timothy 2.16 It is well for us that the apostle had thus written, But they shall proceed no farther for their folly shall be made manifest to all as theirs. Janice and Mambry's also was. Second Timothy End of Section 8、section、9 9 of the Communitory of St. Vincent Lorin Translated by Rev. J. Shanahan This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter 7 the deposit of faith unalterable. When, therefore, some such mercenaries, going through cities and provinces, hawking about their errors for filthy lucre, came to the Galatians, and when the Galatians, having heard them, they became affected with a distaste for truth, and were delighted with the filthy abominations of heretical novelty, removing far from them the manna of apostolical and Catholic doctrine, then the apostolic power exercised its authority, and with the utmost severity decreed, But though we or an angel from heaven preach a gospel to you besides that which we have preached to you, let him be anathema. Galatians 1 verse 8 What is that he says, 
but though we? Why not rather, but though I? This is the meaning. Although Peter, although Andrew, although John, in fine, altogether the whole college of apostles, should preach to you beside what I preached, let him or them be anathema. A dreadful restriction by which he spares neither himself nor the rest of the apostles, in order to keep inviolate the primitive faith. Still, it is not enough. He says, Although an angel from heaven should preach to you besides what you have received, let him be anathema. It was not enough to restrict man in order to keep inviolate the faith once handed down by tradition, without including the angelic order. For he says, Although an angel from heaven, he did not thereby mean that the blessed and heavenly angels can now fall into sin, but this is what he says. If it were a thing that can be, whosoever shall attempt to change the faith handed down by tradition, let him be anathema. But perhaps it may be said, the apostle had spoken thus lightly and decreed from human zeal and not from divine inspiration. God forbid. For the apostle continues the subject, big with importance, and again uncolates it with all the force of reiterated asservation. If anyone preach to you a gospel besides that which you have believed, let him be anathema. He did not say if anyone teach you besides what you received, but he said, let him be anathema, that is, let him be separated, cut off, excommunicated, for fear the baneful contagion of one sheep would infect the sound flock of Christ by the infusion of its poisonous heresy. End of section 9、section、ten of the Communitory of Saint Vincent Lorin, translated by Reverend J. Shanahan. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter 8 The Character and Ways of Heretics. But perhaps some may object and say that these were injunctions peculiar to the Galatians. Now, for the same reason, what the Apostle mentions at the end of the same epistles is binding on the Galatians alone when he says, If we live in the Spirit, let us also walk in the Spirit. Let us not become desirous of vainglory, provoking one another. Envying one another. Galatians 5.26. But if it be absurd to understand the last text with respect to the Galatians, and if it be equally binding on all mankind, it follows evidently that those rules of morality, as well as those points of faith, do equally comprehend all men, and as it is lawful for no one to provoke or envy his neighbor, so likewise, So also is it lawful for no one to believe except what the Catholic Church always had taught. It may be also said that the anathema was leveled against innovations in that age, and that it does not bind after ages. So likewise, this moral precept, I say, walk ye in the Spirit, and you shall not fulfill the lusts of the flesh, regards that age and not after ages. Now, if it be equally impious and destructive to morality to believe so, it follows of necessity that as moral precepts are to be observed in all ages, so likewise those points of faith which are unchangeable are believed and received in all ages. To announce, therefore, to Catholic Christians anything except what they before had believed never was, never is, nor ever will be lawful. And to anathematize those who announce what was not before received, always was, everywhere was, and ever will be a duty. Wherefore, who can be so bold as to preach up what was not taught by the Church? Or who is of that levity that can believe anything except what the Church believed? That vessel of election, that master of the Gentiles, that trumpet of the apostles, That herald of the world, he who knew the secrets of heaven itself, cries out repeatedly, Let him be anathema who preaches up a new doctrine. And on the other hand, some frogs and sinips and other insects, 
but of a day, such as the Pelagians cry out to against the Catholics in this manner. Upon our authority, after our example, after our way of interpreting the Scripture, condemn what you hold and hold what you condemned. Reject the ancient faith, the decrees of the fathers, and the sacred traditions deposited in the hands of your predecessors, and receive our new faith. I tremble at the bare recitation. Their dogmas are so proud that I think it's sinful to express them, nay, even to refute them. End of section 10. Section 11 of the Comminatory of St. Vincent Lorin. Translated by Rev. J. Shanahan. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter 9. False teachers are permitted by providence to exercise the faith and virtue of the faithful. But a man may say, Why does the Almighty suffer some excellent ecclesiastics to announce to Catholics novelties? The question is indeed just and well worthy of the most accurate and full examination. Yet it must be satisfactorily answered, not by my private judgment, but by the authority of the Scripture and the example of ecclesiastical doctors. Let us therefore hear Holy Moses, and he will teach us why learned men and those whom the Apostle styles even prophets, for their knowledge is permitted seemen times to produce new dogmas, which the Old Testament allegorically calls strange gods, because heretics as much adhere to their false opinions as the Gentiles did to their false gods. Therefore the blessed Moses writes in the book of Deuteronomy, If there rise in the midst of thee a prophet, or one that saith he hath dreamed a dream, that is, a doctor of the church, whose scholars or hearers think that he so teaches from a private revelation, what then? Moses proceeds, and he foretells a sign and a wonder, and that come to pass which he spoke, Deuteronomy 13.1. Here indeed is portrayed some great teacher, and of such knowledge, that he seems to his own abettors not only possessed of all human learning, but even gifted with supernatural knowledge. Such exactly did their followers boast of Adonatus, Valentine, Photinus, Apollinaris, and others of the same stamp to have been. Well, what then? And if this prophet shall say to thee, Let us go and follow strange gods, which thou knowest not, and let us serve them, what are these strange gods and less strange errors, which you knew not, that is new and unknown to you before? And let us serve them, that is, let us believe and follow them. What is the conclusion? Thou shalt not hear the words of that prophet and dreamer. And why does God permit that to be taught which he forbids to be followed? Moses gives the reason. Because the Lord your God trieth you, that it may appear whether you love him with all your heart and with all your soul, or no. The reason is as clear as the meridian sun, why the divine providence suffers some ecclesiastics to preach new dogmas. That says he, the Lord your God may try you. And indeed it is a great trial for you to see that he who you consider a prophet, a disciple of a prophet, a seeming defender of truth, and a doctor whom you revered and loved, I say that such a one would, on a sudden, fall so low as to endeavor to mix and slip in the poison of his errors, which you may not soon discover, because as yet you are prejudiced in his favor, as he was of old a faithful master, and also you are not easily prevailed upon to condemn his doctrine, whilst you may be still an admirer of the doctor. End of section 11 Section 12 of the Comminatory of St. Vincent Lorin Translated by Rev. J. Shanahan This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter 10 How Dangerous the Fall of a Great Man But here some may desire to see the words of Moses illustrated with ecclesiastical examples. The request is just and will soon be complied with. 
to expatiate on the great trial before mentioned, I shall instance only modern and manifest examples. When the unhappy Nestorius suddenly changed from being a sheep to become a wolf, began to lacerate the flock of Christ, then those very people, for the most part, who were worried by him, believed him as yet a sheep, and for that reason the more exposed to his poison shafts. For who would be easily led to consider that man to have fallen into error, whom he had lately seen elected bishop with the approbation of the empire, and so greatly favored by the priests? A man whom holy men revered, and whom the populace applauded, who daily expounded the sacred word of God, and confuted every baneful error both of Jews and Gentiles. In fine, who could doubt that he taught, preached, and inwardly believed in sound doctrine? Who inveighed against the blasphemy of every heresy, that he might pave the way to his own single heresy? But this is exactly what Moses said. The Lord your God trieth you, that it may appear whether you love him or no, and that we may pass over Nestorius, who was rather an object of admiration than a subject of utility, a man of empty fame but of little useful learning, who was great in the eyes of the vulgar, not for his piety, but his human and natural volubility. Let us rather speak of those who possessed of greater proficiency and in industry, became subjects of no small trial to Catholic men. Even in the memory of our forefathers, an instance of this kind took place in the upper and lower Pannonia, where Fultonus attacked the church of Sirmium. First he was raised to the priesthood with the good will of all, and for some time officiated as a sound Catholic. But suddenly, like the false prophet or dreamer whom Moses points out, he began to persuade the people of God entrusted to him to follow strange gods, that is, new errors which they did not know before. This is the common rule of all heretics. What was most pernicious in him was that he made use of all his learning to support his impiety. For he was a man of powerful abilities, excelling in his acquired learning, and a man of great eloquence, for he could argue and write in two languages, and that too fluently and solidly which is manifest from the volumes he had written partly in Greek and partly in Latin. But thank God the flock of Christ committed to his charge, being very vigilant and cautious for the Catholic faith, soon looked to the admonitions of Moses. And though they admired the eloquence of their prophet and pastor, yet saw the temptation. For hitherto they followed him as the ram of the flock, and now they began to shun him as a wolf. We learn the danger of this ecclesiastical trial not only from the example of Photonus, but also of Apollinaris, and at the same time we are reminded how careful we ought to be in keeping the true faith, for this man caused great irritation and perplexities in the mind of his hearers, because the authority of the church drew them one way, whilst affection for their old teacher carried them another way. They therefore doubting and wavering did not easily conclude what was best to be done. But it may be said that Apollinaris was such as ought to be despised easily. Nay, he was such that every one would give credit to almost what he said. For who can be his superior in wit, acuteness, and learning? How many heresies did he not suppress in his voluminous writings? How many errors contrary to the faith did he not confute? An instance of this his labor is that excellent and extensive work of his, containing not less than twenty books, in which, by a multiplicity of proofs, he fully refutes the impious calumnies of Porphyry. It would be tedious to enumerate all his works, whereby he might be equal to the greatest men who edified the church, had not the desire of profane curiosity withdrawn him aside to follow his own inventions. And I know not what heretical novelties, which, like a leprosy, overspread and polluted all his writings, so that his doctrine was rather an ecclesiastical trial than the edification of his readers. End of section 12
of the Communitory of St. Vincent Lorin, translated by Rev. J. Shanahan. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter 11 The Impieties of Old Heretics Here, perhaps, it may be required of me to detail the heresies of the aforesaid, that is, of Nestorius, Botanus, and Apollinaris. But that is not my present object, for I only resolved not to be particular as to every error, but merely to instance a few examples whereby I might clearly and evidently demonstrate what Moses says, that if at any time some ecclesiastical doctor, though even a prophet, from his interpreting the mysteries of the prophets, should attempt to introduce some new doctrine into the church of God, divine providence, says Moses, suffers it to be done that our faith be tried by the fire of such temptation. Therefore, it will be useful by way of digression to expose briefly what those heretics, Photonus, Apollinaris, and Nestorius invented. Therefore, this is the heresy of Photonus. He says that there is but one only God, without distinction of persons, as the Jews hold. He denies the plenitude of the Trinity. He does not believe in the person of the Word of God or in that of the Holy Ghost. He asserts that Christ is only mere man, whose origin he ascribes to Mary, and what he supports by every means is that we ought to worship the person of God the Father alone and believe Christ to be only a man. Such was the heresy of Photonus. But Apollinaris indeed boasts as if he truly believed in the unity of the Trinity, and in this point his faith was not real orthodox. By an open profession he blasphemes against the incarnation of our Lord, for he says that in the flesh of our Savior either there was not a human soul at all, or such a soul had not understanding and reason. Besides, he said that the flesh of the Lord was not taken from the flesh of the Blessed Virgin Mary, but came down from heaven into the Virgin. And he waveringly and doubtful taught at one time that his flesh was co-eternal with God, the Word, and at another time that it was only made of the divinity of the Word. For he denied that there are two substances in Christ, the one divine, the other human the one from the Father, the other from his mother. But he supposed the very nature of the word to be divisible, as if some of it remained in God and the rest turned into flesh, so that whilst Catholic truth holds one Christ of two substances, he, on the contrary, asserts that of the one divine nature of Christ are made two substances. Such, therefore, was the heresy of Apollinaris. But Nestorius labors under a distemper different from that of Apollinaris. Whilst he pretends to distinguish two substances in Christ, he immediately introduces two persons, and by an unheard of impiety he holds that there are two sons of God, two Christs, the one God, the other man, the one begotten of the Father, the other of the Mother. Consequently, he asserts that the Blessed Mary is not to be said to be the mother of God, but the mother of Christ, because that Christ who is God was not born of her, but that Christ who is man. In case one thinks that he speaks of one Christ in his writings and preaches one person of Christ, yet he is not to be believed rashly, for either he is possessed of the art of deceiving that by smooth words he can the more easily infuse his poison, as the Apostle says, By that which is good, sin wrought death in me, Romans 7.13. For therefore, as I have said, for the sake of imposition, he has inserted in some passages of his writings that he believes in one Christ and one person of Christ. Or at least after the delivery of the Virgin, he shows that he thought the two persons to have come unto one Christ, yet in such a manner that at the conception or after the birth he contended there were two Christs, so that Christ was born of a mere man not yet associated in unity of person to the word of God, but afterwards the person of the word assuming descended upon him, and although now in the glory of God he remained assumed, yet for some time there seems to have been no distinction between him and other men. 
End of section 13. Section 14 of the Comminatory of St. Vincent Lorin, translated by Rev. J. Shanahan. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter 12. Proofs of the Catholic Faith In the manner I have just described, the mad dogs Nestorius, Apollinaris, and Photinus do bark against the Catholic faith. Photinus, by not confessing the Trinity, Apollinaris, by saying the nature of the divine word is convertible, by not confessing two substances in Christ, and either by denying altogether the soul of Christ, or at least by denying it possessed a mind and reason, or by substituting the word of God for the mind or soul. Nestorius, by asserting there were two Christs, either always or at least for some time. But the Catholic Church, being orthodox, both as to God and our Savior, does not blaspheme, neither in the mystery of the Trinity nor in the incarnation of Christ. For she venerates both one divinity in the plenitude of the Trinity and an equality of three divine persons in one and the same majesty. She confesses also one Christ, Jesus, not two, and the same both God and man. Indeed, she believes one person but two substances. She believes two substances but one person in Christ, two substances because the word of God is immutable and could not itself become flesh. One person, lest by professing two sons, one would seem to worship a cortinity instead of the trinity. But it is worth my labor to unravel this point again, and that too more distinctly and more expressly. In God there is one divine substance but three persons. In Christ there are two substances but one person. In the trinity there is a plurality of persons and one only substance. In our Savior, there is a plurality of substance and only one person. Why is there in the Trinity a plurality of persons and not of substance? Because to wit, one is the person of the Father, one is that of the Son, and one is that of the Holy Ghost. Nevertheless, the nature of the Father, Son, and Holy Ghost is not different, but one and the same. How is there a plurality of substance and not of person in our Savior? Because the substance of the divinity is different from the substance of the humanity, yet the divine and human natures make but one and the same Christ, one and the same Son of God, and one and the same person of the one same Christ and Son of God. As in man the flesh is different in substance from the soul, yet the flesh and soul both together form but one and the same man. In Peter and Paul, the soul is one substance, and the flesh another. Yet the flesh and soul of Peter are not two Peters, but one and the same Peter. Neither is the soul one Paul and the flesh another, but one and the same Paul subsisting in a twofold and different nature of mind and body. Therefore, in like manner, in one and the same Christ there are two substances, but one divine, the other human the one from God the Father, the other from his virgin mother, the one co-eternal and equal to the Father, the other in time and less than the Father, the one consubstantial with the Father, the other consubstantial with his mother. Yet he is one and the same Christ in both substances. Therefore, there is not one Christ God and another man. There is not one Christ in created and another created nor one impassable and the other passable, nor one equal to the Father and the other less, nor one from the Father and the other from the Mother. But one and the same Christ is both God and man, the same Christ, not created and created, the same immutable and impassable, the same mutable and passable, the same equal and less than the Father, the same unbegotten of the Father before all eternity the same in time begotten of his mother, perfect God and perfect man. For as God he possessed the full divinity, and as man he had full humanity. I say full humanity, which has in it both soul and flesh, real flesh as ours is, taken from his mother, 
and a soul endowed with understanding, possessed of memory and reason. There is therefore in Christ the Word, the soul and the body. But all this is one Christ, one Son of God, and one Savior and Redeemer of the world, but one not by any corruptible confusion of the divinity and humanity, but by an integral and singular unity of person. For that union did not convert or change one substance into another. This is the distinguishing error of the Arians. But it rather compacted both substances into one person, so that singularity of one and the same person being in Christ, the properties of both natures remain forever in him, so that God could not become a body, nor that which is once a body cannot cease to be a body. This is demonstrated from the example of the human body. For every man, either in this life or in the next, will consist of a body and soul. Yet the soul will never be changed into a body, nor the body into a soul. But as every man will live forever, so the difference of both substances will necessarily subsist forever also. So likewise in Christ, the properties of both natures will remain forever and that too in the unity of person. End of section 14. Section 15 of the Comminatory of St. Vincent Loren, translated by Rev. J. Shanahan. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter 13. The Humanity of Christ Proved against the Manicheans. Since I have frequently made use of the word person, and said that God became man through person, I am very much afraid, lest I seem to say that God the Word participated of our nature by the mere imitation of our actions, and that all the human conversation he held amongst us was done in appearance and not by a real man. As happens on a theater, when one man represents many persons, and that too on a sudden, whilst he himself is neither of them. For whenever a representation of this kind is exhibited, the actors and men acted or represented are different persons. For instance, to use the comparison of worldlings and Manicheans, when a tragedian represents the priest or king, he is neither a priest himself nor king. When the act is over, the person represented ceases to be. God forbid that we should become so wicked and abominable wretches as to use of such tragical comparisons in our explanation of the Incarnation. We leave this madness to the Manicheans, who preach up a phantom and say that the Son of God was a person of man, the human nature, and only appeared as a man in his actions and conversation. But the Catholic faith teaches us that the Word was made man, so that he really and expressly took and assumed our real human nature, and not fallaciously and fantastically. And what he did as a man was not an imitation of another, but his own very action. And in short, everything he did was a real action. And he himself really was the doer thereof. Just as we ourselves, when we speak, taste, live, subsist, we do not imitate man, but we are the real agents. For Peter and John, to instance them in particular, were not men in imitation, but in reality. For as Paul did not act an apostle or personify Paul, but was a real apostle and a real Paul, so likewise God the Word, by assuming and having flesh, by speaking, acting, suffering in the flesh, yet without any alteration of his divine nature, was pleased to do all this not to imitate or feign himself man, but to prove himself a true and perfect man, not that he might be thought and supposed to be a man, but that he might really be a man and prove himself to be a man. Therefore, as the soul united to the flesh but not converted into flesh is not a representation of man, but a real man, a man not in appearance but in substance, so also God the Word, without any change of itself, is made man by uniting itself to man, not by confusion, not in imitation, but in subsistence. 
Therefore, that idea of person which arises from imitation should be rejected, because then one thing is and a different thing is represented. Then he who acts is not he whom he represents. God forbid that we should believe that God the Word had taken flesh after that fallacious manner but rather thus that his divine substance remaining immutable and assuming unto himself the nature of perfect man, he existed flesh, man, and the very person of man, not figuratively, but really, not imitatively, but substantially. In fine, he did not cease to be God by becoming man, but remained still God and man in both substances. End of section 15 Section 16 of the Comminatory of St. Vincent Lorin Translated by Rev. J. Shanahan This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter 14 The Hypostatical Union Takes Place at the Conception By Which the Divine and Human Natures Are Inseparable in Time and Eternity In the One Person of Christ this union of person in Christ was therefore compacted and made perfect in the womb of the Virgin, and not after the delivery of the Virgin. For we must carefully beware that we confess Christ, not only one, but always one, because it is the height of blasphemy that you grant him even now to be one, whilst you contend that once he was not one but two, one namely after the moment of his baptism, but two after the time of his nativity which great sacrilege we cannot otherwise avoid than by confessing that man was hypostatically united to God in his mother in her womb, in fine, in her virginal conception, and not after the ascension or resurrection or even baptism, for which unity of person the attributes of God are indifferently and promiscuously given to man, and those of man are ascribed to God. John chapter 3.13 Wherefore it is written by divine inspiration that the Son of Man came down from heaven and that the Lord of glory was crucified on earth. 1 Corinthians 2.8 Whence it comes that as the flesh of the Lord being made as the flesh of the Lord being created, so the word of God is said to be made, the very wisdom of God impleted, knowledge created, as in the prophecy, his hands and his feet as said to be dug. Psalm 21.17 I say from this unity of person, this also was perfected by reason of the like mystery, that as the flesh of the word is most catholically believed to be born of the virgin, and it cannot be denied without the greatest impiety, wherefore God forbid that anyone should be so wicked as to endeavor to rob Holy Mary of the privilege of the divine grace and her special glory, for she is to be confessed the Blessed Mother of God, through the special gift of the Lord and our God. But her Son, we are not to call her the Mother of God in that impious sense, which a certain wicked heresy insinuates, which asserts that she is to be styled the Mother of God by mere appellation, because she was the Mother of that man who afterwards became God, as we say the Mother of a priest or the Mother of a bishop, not by being delivered of a priest or bishop at the moment of their birth, but by being the mother of a man who afterward became a priest or bishop. It is not, I say, in this sense, that Holy Mary is the mother of God, but for this reason, as was said before, that in her sacred womb the most holy mystery was accomplished, because through that singular and only unity of person as the word in the flesh is man, so man in God is God. End of section 16. Section 17 of the Communitory of St. Vincent Lorin. Translated by Rev. J. Shanahan. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter 15. A Summary of the Foregoing Chapter. In order to assist the memory, I will more briefly and particularly repeat what I have said already of the foregoing heresies or of the Catholic faith, that by such repetition 
they may be more clearly understood and the more firmly impressed on the mind. Anathema, therefore, to Photinus, who does not believe the plenitude of the Trinity and who professes Christ only as mere man. Anathema to Apollinaris, who asserts the corruption of the divinity changed in Christ and takes away the property of the perfect humanity. Anathema to Nestorius, who denies that God was born of the Virgin, dogmatizing two Christs, and having exploded the faith of the Trinity, introduces a quaternity. But blessed be the Catholic Church, which venerates one God in the plenitude of the Trinity, and also the equality of the Trinity in one divinity, so that neither the singularity of substance confounds the propriety of persons, nor the distinction of Trinity separates the unity of the Godhead. Blessed, I say, be the Catholic Church, which believes two real and perfect natures in Christ, but one person so that neither the distinction of natures divides the unity of his person, nor the unity of his person confounds the difference of natures. Blessed again, I say, be the Church, which confesses Christ to be and to have been always one, which believes him man united to God, not after his birth, but from the moment of his conception in his mother's womb. Blessed be the Church, I say, which understands that God was made man, not by conversion of nature, but by reason of person, of person not counterfeit and transient, but substantial and permanent. Blessed, I say, be the Church, which teaches that this unity of person has that effect that through it, in a wonderful and ineffable mystery, she attributes divine properties to man and human to God. For by virtue of this union, she affirms man, as he was God, came down from heaven, and God, as he was man, was created, suffered, and crucified. And in fine, for this union, she confesses man, the Son of God, and God, the Son of the Virgin. Therefore, blessed and venerable, thrice blessed and sacred, and indeed comparable to celestial praises, be that confession of faith which glorifies the one Lord God with a threefold anthem. Isaiah chapter 6 It is for this reason the Church teaches the unity of Christ, lest she should exceed the mystery of Trinity. I have said these things by way of digression, but if it please God, I will treat and expound them more copiously. Now I will return to my subject. End of section 17. Section 18 of the Communitory of St. Vincent Lorin. Translated by Rev. J. Shanahan. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter 16. He expitiates on chapter 10 above and exemplifies the fall of origin. In the foregoing chapters, therefore, I said that in the church of God, the error of a priest was a temptation of the people, and the greater is the temptation, the more learned he is who errs. This I proved from the authority of the scriptures, and secondly, from the example of some ecclesiastics, who for some time were esteemed of sound faith, yet at length had either fallen into the heresies of others or became arch-heretics themselves. This is indeed a subject big with importance, both useful for instruction and necessary to be kept in memory, which we ought to illustrate and uncolate by all the force of examples, and that too repeatedly, that almost all Catholics may know that it is their bounden duty to receive them with the approbation of the Church and not to desert their Catholic faith upon the bare authority of their teachers. But of the many whom I could adduce and bring forward as instances of such temptations, I am inclined to believe that there is not any comparable to that of Origen, who possessed so many excellent singular and wonderful qualifications, so that in the beginning, 
anyone would easily pledge that faith was to be put in all his assertions. For if a good life be an authority, he was a man of great industry, great charity, patience, and suffering. If kindred and erudition have any influence, who is more noble than him? Who first is born of a family ennobled with the crown of martyrdom, and afterwards was deprived for Christ's sake, not only of his father, but also of all his property? He increased so much in piety in the midst of poverty, that as they say, he was much afflicted oftentimes for his confession of the Lord. Nor were these alone all that made him afterwards a temptation. But yet so great was the power of his genius, so profound, so shrewd, excellent, beautiful in expressions, that he nearly by far surpassed all the learned. Such was the greatness of his learning, and of all his erudition, that there were but very few things in theology, and almost everything in philosophy, but he had a perfect knowledge of. When he became a perfect master of the Greek language, he assiduously acquired a knowledge of the Hebrew. But should I mention his eloquence? For his speech was so pleasing, so sweet, so flowing like milk, that methinks it proceeded from his lips more like honey than words. What subjects difficult to be persuaded of did he not elucidate by the force of his reasoning? What things hard to be done did he not effect so as to become more easily to be understood. But it may be objected, he only weaved his own opinions by the subtlety of his arguments. Not so, for no one ever adduced as proof so many texts of Scripture. But perhaps one may say he wrote but little. No man wrote more, so that I think that all his works could not only be read by one man, but even collected together. Besides, that nothing be wanting to complete his learning, providence granted him a good old age. But perhaps he was somewhat unhappy in his scholars. Who was ever more happy? From his school went forth innumerable doctors, priests, confessors, and martyrs. Who can say what admiration he was held in by all, how great his fame had been, and how much caressed by the whole world? What religious man was there? that did not come to hear him, even from the remotest part of the globe? What Christian that did not venerate him almost as a prophet? What philosopher that did not look upon him as a teacher? History informs us that he was respected not only by persons of private condition, but also by the court, for he was sent for by the mother of the emperor Alexander, merely on account of his celestial wisdom with which he was filled, and in which she earnestly desired to be instructed. But the epistles, which he, with all the authority of a Christian teacher, addressed to Philip, who was the first Christian of the Roman emperors, also give testimony of his interest at court. If a man will not receive the testimony of a Christian with respect to his admirable knowledge, I hope at least, as philosophers say, he will not suspect that of a pagan. For the impious Porphyry says that being excited by the fame of Origen when yet a youth, he had gone to Alexandria to see the man, and there saw him now advanced in years. But such and so great an old man that he seemed to be a storehouse of every science. But time would sooner fail me than I would be able to mention, even in part, all the brilliant qualities of that man, Yet all these, though much redounding to the honor of religion, contribute to make him a temptation of the first magnitude. For who could reject a man of such genius, of such learning, of such esteem, but would rather follow the saying, that he would rather err with origin than follow truth with others? Why need I say more? The matter, in short, came to this, that this great person, this great teacher and prophet, proved in the end a most dangerous and more than human temptation, and led aside many from the integrity of faith. Wherefore, whilst Origen, though so great and learned as he was, wantonly abuses the grace of God, whilst he overfondly indulges his own genius, whilst he entertains too high an opinion of himself, 
whilst he contemns the ancient simplicity of the Christian religion, whilst he pretends himself wiser than all the Christians, whilst he despises the traditions of the church and the doctrines of the ancients, and interprets some passages of the scriptures after a new way, he deserves that the church of God would turn against him these words of Moses. If a prophet rise in the midst of thee, and a little after he says, Thou shalt not hear the words of that prophet, and again he says, Because the Lord your God trieth you, that it may appear whether you love him or no. Indeed, this was not only a temptation, but a very great one, especially to a church devoted to him, and fondly leaning towards him, through admiration of his genius, science, eloquence, conversation, and esteem, no ways suspicious of him, fearing nothing from him. It was a temptation for her to see him turn suddenly from the old religion to profane novelty. But it may be said that the books of origin were corrupted. I do not oppose it, but I wish it were so. This has been handed down by some as well, Catholics as heretics. But this is what we must advert to, that though himself is not, yet the books published in his name are a very great temptation. They abounding in many blasphemies are read as his, and not as the work of any other. They are desired because they are his and not the work of others. And although the genuine sense of origin be far from the invention of errors in faith, yet his authority gives those errors ascribed to him credit and makes them pass as genuine upon the world. End of section 18. Section 19 of the Comminatory of St. Vincent Lorin, translated by Rev. J. Shanahan. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter 17 The same subject further illustrated from the fall of Tertullian into the Montanist heresy. What has been just said is applicable to Tertullian. For what the former was among the Greeks, the latter was the same among the Latins, as being their best writer. For who can be more learned than this man? Who more exercised in divine and human literature? Because he acquired a competent knowledge of all philosophy and all sects of philosophers, authors, supporters of sects, and all their discipline, besides all history, with a variety of other studies, were familiar to the great capacity of his mind. But was not his genius so strong and forcible that almost everything he resolved to attack, he either took it by the penetration of his judgment or crushed it by the force of his arguments? Moreover, who can adequately praise his writings? For they are interwoven with such a chain of arguments that those whom he cannot persuade he impels. Every word of his is a sentence, and every sentence a victory. This is known to the Marcionites, Apelles, Hermogenes, Jews, Gentiles, Gnostics, and others, whose blasphemies he crushed by the weight of his voluminous works as with so much thunder. Nevertheless, this same Tertullian, not holding fast to the Catholic doctrine that is the universal and old faith, and more eloquent than happy, and having changed his creed, he became at last a heretic, as the blessed confessor Hilary somewhere writes of him, by his latter errors he lessened the authority of these his approved writings. Moreover, he himself too was a great temptation to the church. But of this I shall say no more. This only I shall remark, that by following the novel madness of Montanus, contrary to the precepts of Moses, and receiving, taking, and supporting the dreams of his fanatic females, to be true prophecies, Tertullian deserved that it should be both said of him and of his writings, If a prophet shall arise among you, etc., thou shalt not hear the words of that prophet, because the Lord your God trieth you, that it may appear whether you love him with your whole heart or with all your soul or no. End of section 19. Section 20 of the Comminatory of St. Vincent Lorin, 
Translated by Rev. J. Shanahan. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter 18 God Permits the Fall of Some to Exercise the Faith and Love of the Catholics Towards Him From so many and so great examples of the fall of eminent ecclesiastics, we ought evidently see, and according to the laws of Deuteronomy clearly conclude, that if at any time some ecclesiastical doctor should swerve from the faith, that divine providence permits this to happen as a trial for us, that it may appear whether we love God with our whole heart and with our whole soul or not. End of section 20section 21 of the Communitory of saint vincent lorin translated by reverend j shanahan this librivox recording is in the public domain chapter 19 the security and steady faith of the catholic and the condition of heretics divided among themselves and tossed about by every wind of doctrine wherefore he is a true and genuine catholic who loves the truth of God, who loves his church, and who loves the body of Christ, who prefers nothing to the Catholic faith, neither the authority, nor the love, nor wit, nor eloquence, nor philosophy of any man. But, despising all these, and remaining firm, fixed, and steady, he will know how to hold whatever the Catholic Church anciently and universally believed, and decrees that this alone is to be held and believed. And whatever new and unheard of doctrine he shall see introduced by any one contrary to all the saints, he is to understand that such is to be considered a temptation and not an article of faith. And especially this is more reasonable when he is taught from the divine eloquence of St. Paul in his first epistle to the Corinthians, who writes, For there must also be heresies, that they also, who are approved, may be made manifest among you. 1 Corinthians 11.19 As if he said, On account of such or such heresy, God has not destroyed their authors miraculously, that those who are approved may be made manifest, that is, that it may appear that every one be a firm, steady, and fixed lover of the Catholic faith. And indeed, whenever any novelty is broached, it is easy to feel the weight of the good grain from the lightness of the chaff. And there is not much labor in fanning from the threshing floor what was kept there by no weight. For some fly off instantly, others are only shaken up, are afraid to perish, and wounded are ashamed to return. These become half dead and half alive, because they have imbibed such quantity of poison that it neither kills them nor can be digested, nor compels them to die, nor suffers them to live. Alas, a miserable condition! With what tides of cares, by what whirlwinds, are they tossed to and fro? At one time, by their rising error, they are hurried away, wheresoever the wind of novelty blows them. At another, they turn against themselves and are dashed to pieces, like so many conflicting. Now, with rash presumption, they approve those things that are uncertain. Again, they tremble with unreasonable fear at those things that are certain. They are uncertain where to go, where to return, what to seek, what to flee, what to hold, what to relinquish. And indeed, this affliction of a doubtful, unfortunate, vibrating heart is a remedy intended by Providence for their conversion. Were they only wise to use it? For therefore, without the most safe haven of the Catholic faith, they are shaken by the diversity of their opinions, are buffeted and almost shattered to pieces by the storms of new changes, that they ought to take down those sails of pride which they had spread to navigate the sea of heresy, and return back into the most safe harbor of their peaceful and good mother, and firmly adhere to her, and radically throw away from them the bitter and swelling waters of error, that they might afterwards be able to drink of the streams of living and springing water. In her bosom, let them have a correct knowledge of all the doctrines of the Church, which can be comprehended by their understanding, 
and believe what surpasses the understanding. End of section 21. Section 22 of the Comminatory St. Vincent Lorin. Translated by Rev. J. Shanahan. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter 20 The fickleness of reformers changing every day their notions on religion, that we should hold fast the old faith, avoid novelty, an exhortation to return to Catholicity. Wherefore, having repeatedly meditated upon these things, I cannot but be astonished at the great madness of some men, at the impiety of their blind understanding, and finally, at their great lust of inventing errors, that they do not rest with the old rule of faith, once delivered to the saints and received, but are every day seeking novelties, and always inclined to add something new to religion, to change it, or to take away therefrom, as if the doctrine were not from heaven, and what was once revealed is not sufficient, but a human institution, which cannot otherwise be brought to perfection than by continual corrections, nay, rather, animadversions. Nevertheless, the divine oracles cry out, Pass not beyond the ancient bounds which thy fathers have set. Proverbs chapter 22, verse 28. Judge not against a judge. Ecclesiastes 8.17 He that breaketh a hedge, a serpent shall bite him. Ecclesiastes 10.8 Likewise, that charge of the apostle, by which, as it were, by a spiritual sword, all wicked novelties of all wicked heresies have often, and always will be, lopped off. O Timothy, keep that which is committed to thy trust, avoiding the profane novelties of words, and oppositions of knowledge falsely so called, which some, promising, have erred concerning the faith. 1 Timothy 6, verse 21 Notwithstanding all this, there are some of such hardihood, of brazen effrontery, of such consummate impudence, of such unexampled obstinacy, that do not yield to the force of such celestial eloquence, nor do they give way to its weight. Men who are not shaken by such power, nor moved by such fulminating expressions, avoid, says he, the profane novelties of words. He did not say, avoid the primitive and ancient doctrines, but plainly the contrary. For if novelty is to be avoided, antiquity is to be held fast. And if novelty be profane, it follows of necessity that antiquity is sacred. The Apostle proceeds, Avoid oppositions of knowledge, falsely so called. A correct epithet for the notions of heretics, as they endeavor to gloss over their ignorance with the title of knowledge, their darkness light, and light darkness, which some, he says, promising, have erred concerning faith. Promising what? Why some strange unheard of doctrines, one can hear them thus speaking. Come to us, O ye unwise and simple wretches, ye who are commonly called Catholics, and from us learn the faith, which besides us no one understands, which for many ages lay hidden from the world, but lately revealed and made manifest to us, but you must learn privily and by stealth, for it will most certainly please you, and moreover, when you shall have learned our way of thinking, teach it silently, lest the world hear you, or the church know of it. For it is given but to few to know the secrets of so great a mystery. Now are the words of that harlot who in the Proverbs of Solomon calls to them that pass by the way and go on their journey. He that is a little one, let him turn to me. She entreats those that want understanding and says to them, Stolen waters are sweeter and hidden bread is more pleasant. But what further? Why, he did not know that giants are there, and that her guests are in the depths of hell. Proverbs 9.15 and 16.17 Who are those giants? The Apostle explains it. They are those who erred concerning the faith. End of section 22
Section 23 of the Communitory of St. Vincent Loren Translated by Rev. J. Shanahan This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter 21 A Further Illustration of the Words of St. Paul to Timothy, His Beloved Disciple But it is profitable to weigh every word of that memorable charge of the Apostle. O Timothy, says he, Keep that which is committed to thy trust, avoiding the profane novelties of words. Oh, this is an exclamation of foreknowledge and of charity. For he had a foreknowledge of those errors which were to be invented in future times and wept over them. But who is the Timothy of our times? Why, either generally the whole church, or in particular the whole body of bishops, who ought to have a foreknowledge of divine worship and to teach it to others. What means keep that which is committed to thy trust? Keep that sacred depositum, lest while men are asleep at night, thieves and enemies come, and sow tares among the good seed of the wheat which the Son of Man had sowed in his field. Keep that which is committed to thy trust, says he. What means that which is committed to thy trust? It means that which is committed to thee, and not that which is invented by thee. It means that which you have received and not what you have fabricated, a doctrine not of human invention but divinely taught, not of private monopoly but of public tradition, a doctrine handed down to you and not made by you, and of which you must not be the author but the keeper, not the institutor but the follower, not leading but following. Keep that, says he, which is committed to thy trust. Keep the talent of Catholic faith pure and inviolable. Let that which is entrusted to you remain with you and be handed down by you to others. You have received gold, return gold, as I cannot abide to be repaid by you in worse coin than I gave. So I would not have you return lead for gold, or fraudulently give it the specious tinsel of brass. I am not satisfied with the appearance, but the real nature and substance of gold. O Timothy, O Bishop, O Preacher, O Doctor, if the gift of God has made thee fit and worthy in abilities, in practice, and doctrine, be thou the Bessalel of the spiritual tabernacle, the Catholic Church. Carve out the precious gems of divine revelation, set them in order with fidelity, adorn them with wisdom, set forth their brilliancy, beauty, and grace. When you preach, let that which you expound be so elucidated that it be understood by your hearers, though before only obscurely believed. Nevertheless, teach the same things you have learned, so that although you teach after a new mode, by perspicuity in explanation, yet that you may not teach anything new. End of section 23section 24 of the communitory of st vincent lorin translated by rev j shanahan this librivox recording is in the public domain chapter 22 in the revelation of jesus christ is implicitly contained what has since been explicitly defined by the church the pillar and ground of truth but a man may say shall not therefore be any proficiency of religion in the Church of Christ? Yes, most undoubtedly, and that too very great. For how can there be one so envious to man, or so hateful to God, as to endeavor to prevent it? Nevertheless, it must be an explicit explanation of faith, and not a change. Indeed, improvement tends to bring the subject to its perfection, whilst alteration transforms it into a heterogeneous stuff. The understanding, knowledge, and wisdom of all men, of every age and condition, in the whole church, ought therefore increase and come to perfection. Yet in the self-same doctrine, and in the same sense and meaning, let the religion of the soul imitate the gradual increase of the body, which in the process of time counts over its number of years, yet it remains still the same body. 
There is much difference between the bloom of youth and the maturity of old age, but yet the old men are the self-same who were youths, so that although the state or manner of the same be changed, nevertheless his nature is the same, and his person the same. The tender limbs of the infant and his robust limbs in manhood are yet the very same. The child has all the members of man, and whatever we find produced by maturity of age is but an evolution of that which was in the seed. So that no new perfection accrues to man from old age, as in youth, all that had been remained hidden within him. Whence there can be no doubt that this is the lawful and right rule of improving, that is, the proper and fairest mode of increasing faith, provided that the number of years spins out to old age the same principles and forms which the wisdom of the Creator formed in the tender stage. But if the human shape should be transformed into some unnatural form, or that something be added to or taken from the number of members, it must come to pass necessarily that the whole body be either destroyed or become a monster, or at least debilitated. In like manner, the doctrine of the Christian religion must follow these laws and rules in its improvement and proficiency. That is, it is to be consolidated by years, to be spread by degrees, and become sublime by age. Nevertheless, it must remain uncorrupted and unstained, and be full and perfect in all its parts, in all its members, and in its proper meaning. Moreover, it must admit of no change or of no diminution of its propriety. It must suffer no variety in its definitions. For example's sake, our fathers had sowed of the old seed of the wheat of faith in the field of the church. It is very iniquitous and unprincipled of us their posterity to endeavor to gather the suppositious errors of cockle instead of the genuine truths of the good seed. But it is truly meet and just that our consequences be rightly deduced from our antecedents, and that we reap a wheat harvest of sound doctrine from the good seed of the same kind, so that, when through the process of time, anything should grow up from these primary seeds and is now in bloom and highly cultivated, and though nothing is to be changed in its genuine production, Yet method, beauty, form, and distinction may be added. Nevertheless, the nature of every species remains the same. God forbid that the pleasant nursery of the Catholic sense be converted into thistles and thorns. God forbid, I say, that in this spiritual paradise, cockle and hemlock should germinate from stalks of cinnamon and balsam. Whatever, therefore, has been sown by the faith of our fathers in this field of the Church of God, this should be cultivated and improved by the industry of us, their posterity. This same should flourish and become mature, that is, it should be improved and brought to perfection. For it is proper that in the course of time those ancient doctrines of celestial philosophy be carefully kept, filed and polished. But it is unlawful that they be changed, broken, or mutilated. They may admit evidence, perspicuity, and distinction, yet must retain their plenitude, their integrity, and propriety. For if the liberty of impious fraud be once admitted, I shudder to say what danger of destroying and abolishing religion may follow. For if any part of Catholic doctrine be once rejected, and soon another and another part will also be given up, these again will be followed by more and more, and the custom of changing being once a precedent, they will reject and rescind more and more every day. And when the parts are rejected, what will be the consequence? But that they will reject the whole. But if, on the contrary, they begin to mix their novelties with the old religion, foreign with domestic, and profane with sacred, this custom may universally spread so that necessarily in the church there would be nothing left uncorrupted, nothing unstained, nothing undefiled. But it becomes the receptacle of impious and shameful errors, though before the sanctuary of chaste and uncorrupted truth. 
but may the divine goodness preserve the minds of the faithful from such impiety, and let this be the effect of the frenzy of the impious. But the Church of Christ, the careful and cautious guardian of the doctrines committed to her charge, never changes anything in them, diminishes nothing, adds nothing, does not lop off things necessary, does not engraft superfluous things, loses nothing, never usurps what does not belong to her, but makes her only concern to treat faithfully and wisely of antiquity, so that if she find anything not properly defined but only began in antiquity, she corrects and polishes it, and confirms and strengthens whatever she finds to have been of old expressed and clear. And whatever she finds already confirmed and defined, she keeps carefully. Finally, why has she ever depended on the decrees of councils? Only that what was simply believed before may for the future be more diligently believed and be more pressingly preached and be the more religiously venerated and kept sacred. This, I say, is what the Catholic Church has always done through the decrees of her councils. Whenever she was attacked by the rising renovations of heretics, except that whatever she received from the fathers through tradition alone, she consigned to the written manuscripts for the use of posterity by comprising a great number of subjects in a few words, and more frequently, to enlighten the understanding by sealing no new sense of faith by the propriety of a new term. End of section 24 Section 25 of the Comminatory of St. Vincent Lorin Translated by Rev. J. Shanahan This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter 23 Heresy to be avoided as a scorpion The Catholic Church alone always the same Tradition her support Novelties to be rejected All heretics separated from the Catholic Church But let us return to the Apostle O Timothy, keep that which is committed to thy trust Avoiding the profane novelties of words 1 Timothy 6.20 Avoid them, says he, as you would a viper, a scorpion, a basilisk, lest they poison you mortally, not only with their bite, but even with their sight and breath. What does he mean by avoiding? Why truly, not to eat with such, 1 Corinthians 5.11. What means avoid? Because, says St. John, 2 Epistle 6.10, if any man come to you and bring not this doctrine, what doctrine, but that Catholic and universal doctrine, which remaining one and the same in every successive age, without interruption, through the uncorrupt tradition of truth, will so continue the same forever? What then? Because, says the Apostle, receive him not into the house, nor say to him, God speed you. For he that saith unto him, God speed you, communicateth with his wicked works. Again, avoid the profane novelties of words, says he. What is the meaning of profane? Because they have nothing sacred in them, nothing religious, and are wholly foreign from the bosom of the church, which is the temple of God. Profane novelties of words, says he. That is, novelties of doctrine, of subjects, and of opinions, which are contrary to antiquity and everything taught and believed of old, which, if they be received, it is necessary that the faith of the Holy Fathers be violated, either entirely or for the greater part. It also follows of necessity, in case that all the faithful of all ages, all the saints, all the chaste continent virgins, all the clergy, deacons and priests, all the thousands of confessors, the whole armies of martyrs, the crowds of cities and multitudes of people, so many islands, provinces, kings, people, nations, kingdoms, in fine, nearly the whole world, united to Christ, the head, by the Catholic faith, must be pronounced ignorant, erroneous, blasphemous, 
and not to have known for many ages what a Christian ought to believe. Avoid, says he, the profane novelties of words, which Catholics never receive nor follow, but which heretics ever did. And indeed, what heretical novelty was there ever broached, but we can point out its author, the place and time of its birth? Who is the founder of any heresy that did not separate himself from the communion of the ancient Catholic universal church? Now examples prove this, but too clear. For before the profane Pelagius, who had the presumption to claim such high prerogative for free will, as to think that the grace of God is not necessary to assist us to do good works, who before his monstrous disciple Celestinus had denied all mankind guilty of original sin through the guilt of Adam's prevarication, who before the sacrilegious Arius dared to dissolve the unity of Trinity, who before the impious Sibelius presumed to confound the trinity of persons in the unity of one Godhead, who before the wicked Novation said God is cruel, that he would rather the death of the sinner than that he be converted and live, who before Simon Magus, stricken by the apostolic sword, from whom that old sink of impurities have through a continued dark secession flowed down to Priscillian the last would dare say that God was the author of evil, that is, of our crimes, impieties, and wickedness. For he affirms that God with his own hands created the very nature of man, such that he, Adam, by his own power, and by the impulse of, as it were, some necessary will, could do nothing, will nothing but sin, so that his nature being harassed and inflamed by the fire of every vice, was plunged in all manner of uncleanness by an unsatiable passion. There are innumerable other examples of this kind, which I omit for brevity's sake, from all which we can evidently and clearly see, how remarkable and constant a custom it is with heretics to pride themselves in their novelties, to nauseate the decrees of antiquity, and by the opposition of pretended knowledge make a shipwreck of faith, but on the other hand, truly it has been always the grand characteristic of Catholics to keep inviolable the deposit of the fathers, and whatever was committed to their trust to condemn profane novelties. And as the Apostle repeats it, If any man preach to you a gospel besides that which you have received, let him be anathema. Galatians 1.9 End of section 25。section 26。of the Comminatory of Saint Vincent Lorin。translated by Reverend J. Shanahan。this LibriVox recording is in the public domain。chapter 24。the subtlety of heretics in quoting scripture。and resting it to suit their novel opinions。Here, perhaps, it may be asked if heretics use the testimonies of the Holy Scriptures. They do, and vehemently too. For you may see them fly through the whole of the volumes of the Holy Law, the books of Moses, of Kings, the Psalms, Apostles, Gospels, and Prophets. And whether among themselves or with strangers, in public or private, in their talk or books, at meals or in the streets, you will scarcely ever hear them utter a syllable that do not pretend to express according to Scripture phraseology. Read the small works of Paul of Samosota, of Priscillian, of Eunomius, of Jovian, and the other pests of Christendom, and you will see the great mass of texts, so that almost no page can be found that is not stuffed and colored with sentences of the Old and New Testament. But they are the more to be guarded against and dreaded, the more they cloak their impiety under the garb of Holy Scripture. For they well know that their fulsomeness will be agreeable to none if it be exposed nakedly and simply. They therefore sprinkle them, as it were, with spices of holy writ, that he who would otherwise see through their errors with contempt might not despise so quick what they conceal under the name of Scripture. 
and therefore they exactly do what those are wont to, who, when they are about to temper some strong dose for children, put some sugar in their mouth, that their unsuspecting age, having first tasted of sweetness, may the more easily swallow the bitter pill. Or as quacks, who give baneful herbs and noxious distillations, the plausible titles of infallible cures, that no one who would read the fine advertisements of their pretended medicines would suspect a latent poison. Wherefore our Savior cried out, Beware of false prophets, who come to you in the clothing of sheep, but inwardly are ravening wolves. Matthew 7.15 What is the clothing of the sheep but the word of the prophets and apostles, which they with simplicity of a sheep have woven together for the immaculate lamb, who taketh away the sins of the world as a woolen fleece? Who are the ravening wolves but the fierce and mad interpretations of heretics, which infest always the sheepfold of the church, and tear the flock of Christ by every means in their power, and to steal more slyly upon the heedless sheep, though keeping interiorly the ferocity of the wolf, they exteriorly put off its name and cover themselves with Bible texts, as with fleeces of wool, so that no one would suspect the fangs of a wolf where nothing is visible but the softness of a sheep. But what says our Savior? By their fruits you shall know them. Matthew 7.16 That is, when they shall begin not only to produce those divine scripture phrases, but also to explain them, nor yet to repeat them over, but to interpret them, it is then that bitterness, acerbity, fanaticism will be manifest. Then their newly invented poison will exude its venom. Then their profane novelties will be exposed. Then you may see the hedge dragged down, the bounds of the fathers removed, the Catholic faith cut off, and the doctrine of the church torn to pieces. Such were they whom the apostle in his epistle to the Corinthians condemns, saying, For such false apostles, says he, are deceitful workmen, transforming themselves into the apostles of Christ. 2 Corinthians 11.13 What means transforming themselves into the apostles of Christ? The apostles quoted the divine law of Moses. These do the same. The apostles made use of the authorities of the Psalms. So do these too. The apostles produced the texts of the prophets. These produce it in like manner. But when they do not interpret in the same sense those texts, which they quote equally, then you may easily distinguish the simple apostles from the deceitful, the real from the masked, the upright from the perverse, and in short, the true apostles from the false apostles. And no wonder, for Satan himself transformeth himself into an angel of light, Second Corinthians 11.14. It is not therefore astonishing if his ministers transform themselves as the ministers of justice. Therefore, according to the doctrine of the Apostle Paul, as often as either false apostles, false prophets, or false teachers produce texts of holy writ, and by their false interpretations endeavor to prop up their errors, there is not the least doubt but they follow the machination of the devil their master which indeed he would never invent unless he knew that an easier scheme for deception cannot be than to cloak with the authority of Scripture impious doctrines which he steals into the world. End of section 26。section 27 of the Communitory of St. Vincent Loren Translated by Rev. J. Shanahan. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter 25 The Devil Quoted Scripture to Tempt Jesus Christ. Heretics Quote It to Tempt Catholics at the Suggestion of Satan Their Master. But someone will say, How can it be proved that the devil is wont to make use of the Scripture? Let him read the Gospel, in which it is written, then the devil took him, 
that is our Lord and Savior, up into the holy city, and set him upon the pinnacle of the temple, and said to him, If thou be the Son of God, cast thyself down. For it is written, that he hath given his angels charge over thee, and in their hands they shall bear thee up, lest perhaps thou dash thy foot against a stone. Matthew 4, 5. What will not he do against poor and miserable men when he dared to tempt the Lord of Majesty with testimonies of Scripture? If, he says, thou be the Son of God, cast thyself down. Why? He says, for it is written, It is our duty to attend to and deeply imprint the force of this passage on our minds, that from this striking example of the evangelist's authority, we may not at all doubt but that the devil speaks to us through those whom we will see quoting the texts of the apostles or prophets against the Catholic faith. For as then the head spoke to the head, so now the members speak to the members. I say the members of the devil speak to the members of Christ, the perfidious to the faithful, the sacrilegious to the religious, in fine, the heretics to the Catholics. But then, what in this place does the devil say? If, he says, thou be the Son of God, cast thyself down. That is, if you wish to be the Son of God, and to receive the inheritance of the kingdom of heaven, cast thyself down. That is, sever thyself from the doctrine and tradition of that sublime church, which is taken for the temple of God. But if one ask any of the heretics, who would persuade, how do you prove, on what authority do you teach, that I ought to leave the universal and ancient faith of the Catholic Church? He abruptly says, For it is written. And forthwith he prepares a thousand testimonies, a thousand authorities, and examples from the law, the Psalms, the Apostles, and the Prophets. And having interpreted them after a novel and bad way, the unhappy soul is even precipitated from the Catholic pillar into the bottomless pit of heresy. It is astonishing how heretical men have got into the habit of deceiving the incautious by such promises as the following. For they dare promise and teach that in their church, that is in the meeting of their connection, there is great and special and fully personal gifts of the Spirit of God, so that without any labor, without any study, without industry, nay, without asking, without seeking or knocking, all of their way of thinking can be so divinely dispensed with that they, raised by angelic hands, that is, preserved by angelic protection, can never hurt their foot against a stone, that is, never fall into the sin of scandal. End of section 27《Section 28 of the Communitory of St. Vincent Lorin Translated by Rev. J. Shanahan This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter 26 What the Catholic must do against the guile of heretics who tempt him. He is to trust to the traditions and doctrine of the one holy and Catholic Church. Those who reject that Church reject God. But it may be asked, if both the devil and his disciples make use of Holy Writ, its texts and promises, some of which are false apostles, some false prophets and false teachers, and all and every of them heretics, what are Catholic men and the children of the Mother Church to do? How will they distinguish truth from falsehood in the sacred scripture? They must take special care to act as in the beginning of this comminatory which I have written according to what holy and learned men handed down to us, and is this, that they are to interpret the canon of the Scriptures according to the traditions of the universal Church and according to the rules of the Catholic faith. Also, in which Catholic and apostolical Church, it is necessary that they follow universality, antiquity, and consent. And if at any time it should so happen, that a part rebel against universality, that novelty rebel against antiquity, 
or a secession of one or a few erroneous men rise up against the consent of all, or indeed nearly the greater part of Catholics, let them prefer the integrity of universality to the corruption of a part, in which same universality let them prefer the religion of antiquity to the profanity of novelty, and likewise, in antiquity itself, let them prefer the general decrees, if any be, of an ecumenical council to the temerity of one or of very few. Moreover, if that be not defined, let them follow what is nearest in its authority, the concurring decision of many and great doctors. By faithfully, soberly, and carefully observing this rule, with the help of the Lord, we will, without much difficulty, be able to detect all the baneful errors of rising heretics. End of section 28section 29 of the communitory of st vincent lorin translated by reverend j shanahan this librivox recording is in the public domain chapter 27 heresy to be refuted by the bible explained in general sense of the holy fathers and decisions of councils no one must despise the catholic church here now I see it follows of necessity that I demonstrate by examples the manner in which the profane novelties of heretics may be detected and condemned, by quoting and confronting with them the doctrines unanimously maintained by the primitive fathers. Nevertheless, this ancient consent of the fathers is not to be investigated or followed in all the petty questions of the divine law, but only indeed and chiefly in the rule of faith and that, too, with great care. But this method is not always to be followed, nor against all heresies, but only when novel and recent novelties make their first appearance, when, from want of time, such heretics are prevented from vitiating the rules of ancient faith, and before the poison having extensively spread, they endeavor to adulterate the works of the fathers. But widely extended and inveterate heresies are not at all to be attacked in this way, because from the process of time they had full opportunity of embracing truth. And therefore, it behooves us to refute those more ancient profanities, either of schisms or heresy, no otherwise than, if it be necessary, either by the sole authority of Scripture, or shun them already of old condemned and rejected by the general councils of Catholic bishops. Therefore, as soon as the rottenness of any evil error shall begin to break out and pilfer some words of the Bible for its defense, and falsely and fraudulently expound them, immediately the decisions of the fathers are to be collected for the interpreting of the sacred canon. By these, the decision of the fathers, Every novelty, whatever, that will rise up will be clearly detected as profane, without the least ambiguity, and will be condemned without any retractation. But the decisions of those fathers alone are to be admitted, who, living in sanctity, teaching in wisdom, and constantly persevering to the end of their lives in the Catholic faith and communion, merited either to die faithfully in Christ or happily to be put to death for Christ. Nevertheless, we must entrust them with this proviso, that whatever tenant all or the greater part of them had manifestly, frequently, and perseveringly confirmed in one and the same sense, by receiving, holding, and delivering down the same, as it were by a concurring council of doctors, that tenant we must hold as indebutable, certain, and ratified. However holy and learned, though a bishop, though a confessor and martyr, yet if such a one hold anything besides or contrary to all that is to be classed distinctly among the peculiar private and hidden petty opinions, far from the common and public general decision, lest we follow the novel error of one man to the evident danger of our salvation, by rejecting the ancient truth of Catholic doctrine, after the sacrilegious manner of heretics and schismatics. 
lest anyone imagine that he may with temerity despise the holy and Catholic consent of those holy fathers. The apostle in the first epistle to the Corinthians says, And God indeed hath set some in the church, first apostles, of whom he was one, secondarily prophets, such as we read Abagus was, in the Acts of the Apostles. Thirdly, doctors, 1 Corinthians 12.28, who are now called preachers, whom the very same apostles sometimes classes among the prophets, because the mysteries of those prophets are clearly explained to the people. Whosoever shall despise those men divinely appointed in all ages and nations in the church, unanimously agreeing on some one point in the sense of a Catholic tenet, such a one does not despise man but God, lest anyone differ from their infallible unity. The same apostle the more earnestly beseeches, saying, Now I beseech you, brethren, that you all speak the same thing, and that there be no schisms among you, but that you be perfect in the same mind and in the same judgment. 1 Corinthians 1 verse 10 But anyone shall revolt from the communion of their doctrine. He will hear this of the apostle. God is not the God of dissension, but of peace. That is, not of him who separates himself from unity of teaching, but of those who persevered in the unity of doctrine. As also I teach, says he, in all the churches of the saints, 1 Corinthians 14.33, that is of Catholics, which churches are holy because they persist in the communion of one faith. And lest any person, having no regard for others, would become so arrogant that he alone should be heard and believed, the apostle says a little after, or did the word of God come out from you, or came it only to you? And for fear this would not make a deep impression, he adds, if any seem to be a prophet or spiritual, let him know the things that I write to you, that they are the commandments of the Lord. 1 Corinthians 14.37 And which commandments are these, but that whosoever is a prophet or spiritual, that is a teacher of things spiritual, that he with all care be a follower of equality and unity, that indeed he neither would prefer his own opinions to those of others, nor secede from the decisions of all. The apostle says, If any man know not these commandments, he shall not be known. 1 Corinthians 14.38 That is he who there is does not learn what he is ignorant of, or despises what he knows, shall not be known. That is, he shall be deemed unworthy of being looked upon as one of those who are divinely united in faith and put upon an equality by their humility, than which misfortune I know nothing more miserable. Nevertheless, we have seen that misery befall, according to apostolic threat, Julian the Pelagian, who either neglected to incorporate himself to himself with the doctrine of his colleagues or presumed to dismember himself from their communion. But it is now time to produce the examples which we had promised, when and how the decisions of the Holy Fathers were gathered together, in order that the rule of ecclesiastical faith be fixed according to them from the decree and authority of a council, that this object may be done the more conveniently. Let this then be the limit of this combinatory, that we may take what follows from another exordium. End of section 29. Section 30 of the Comminatory of St. Vincent Lorin, translated by Rev. J. Shanahan. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter 28 The second Comminatory is lost and all that remains of it is a few fragments, nay, a mere recapitulation, which is thereto rejoined. This is observed in all the editions and manuscripts of St. Vincent's Comminatory. Chapter 28 Recapitulation of the Two Comminatories Rule of Faith is the Bible and the Tradition of the Catholic Church when these things are so, it is now time to recapitulate, 
at the end of this second comminatory these matters which we have laid down in these two comminatories. We have said in the foregoing that the custom of Catholics always had been and is at this day this that they prove the true faith by this twofold manner, first by the authority of Holy Scripture, and secondly by the tradition of the Catholic Church. Not that the canon of Holy Scripture alone is not of itself sufficient unto all things, but because so many who interpret the Word of God, most of them after their own fancy, bring into the world various opinions and errors, so that it becomes necessary that the understanding of the heavenly Scripture be directed according to the one rule of the sense of the Church, and the more especially on these questions on which the grounds of the whole Catholic doctrine do rest. Moreover, we have also said that we ought to behold in the Church itself the consent as well as the universality as of antiquity, lest we be severed from the integrity of unity and fall into a schismatical faction, or be precipitated from the religion of antiquity into the novelties of heresy. Likewise, we have said that in the very antiquity of the Church two things are to be firmly and carefully observed, whereunto all those who will not be heretics must faithfully adhere. First, they must adhere to whatever has been decreed of old by all the bishops of the Catholic Church, assembled together in a general council. Secondly, if any new question may arise when the definition of a council cannot be had, we must then have recourse to the decisions of the Holy Fathers, and among them of these only, who in their own times and places, continuing in the unity of the communion and faith, had been esteemed approved doctors, and whatever we find them to have unanimously approved in one and the same sense, that we are without scruple to believe to be the true and Catholic sense of the Church lest we may seem to draw forth anything from our own presumption, rather than from the authority of the Church. We have applied the example of a holy council, which had been nearly three years since celebrated at Ephesus in Asia, in the consulship of Bassus and Antiochus, where, when the fathers of the council were debating about defining the rules of faith, lest perhaps some profane novelty might creep in like unto the perfidity at Rimni, to all the bishops who were there assembled to the number of nearly two hundred, this seemed to be the most Catholic, the most faithful, and the most expedient, to produce before all the decisions of the Holy Fathers, some of whom it was manifest were martyrs, some confessors, but all were Catholic bishops and persevered so to the end of their lives, in order that the religion of the ancient doctrine may be confirmed, duly and solemnly, by their unanimity and decree, and that the blasphemy of profane novelty may be condemned. When that had been done, the impious Nestorius was judged to be contrary to Catholic antiquity, whilst the blessed Cyril was pronounced conformable to sacred antiquity and that nothing be wanting to the fidelity of these proceedings, we have given as well the names as the number, although we have forgotten the order of those fathers according to whose joint and unanimous sentence even the words of the Holy Bible were explained and the rule of divine doctrine corroborated, that the memory of this be the more lasting. I do not think it by any means superfluous to record them here. End of section 30. Section 31 of the Communitory of St. Vincent Loren, translated by Rev. J. Shanahan. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter 29 A list of those fathers whose writings were consulted as a criterion whereby the fathers at Ephesus explained the Bible and confirmed the old, true, and one Catholic faith. Therefore, these are the men, the writings of whom, either as judges or as witnesses, were read in that council. 
St. Peter, Bishop of Alexandria, a most excellent doctor and a most blessed martyr, St. Athanasius, prelate of the same city, a most orthodox doctor and a most eminent confessor, St. Theophilus also, bishop of the same city, and a man very remarkable for his faith, his life, and learning, who was succeeded by the Venerable Cyril, who at this time is the ornament of the Alexandrian Church. And lest it should be imagined that this is the doctrine of one particular city and province, they also had recourse to the luminaries of Cappadocia, St. Gregory of Nazianzum, St. Basil of Caesarea in Cappadocia, Bishop and Confessor likewise, the other St. Gregory of Nyssen, Bishop who, by the merit of his faith, his conversation, the integrity of his life, and the excellence of his wisdom, was worthy of such a great brother as Basil. But it is not only Greece alone and the East, but also the Western and Latin world was proved to have been always so convinced. And to show this, there were read in the same council some letters of St. Felix, martyr, and St. Julius, bishops of the city of Rome, which letters were directed to some of the fathers. But to make it appear further, that not only the head of the world, but also the other members thereof gave testimony to that judgment. From the south, the most blessed Cyprian, bishop of Carthage, and martyr, is brought in as evidence. From the north, St. Ambrose, bishop of Milan. Therefore, all these, having constituted the sacred number of the Decalogue, were produced at Ephesus as doctors, counselors, witnesses, and judges, whose doctrine that sacred synod holding, whose counsel following, believing in whose testimony, whose judgment obeying, had pronounced on the rules of faith without tediousness, presumption, and favor. Although a more ample catalog of the ancients could have been adduced, it was not necessary, because the time of business ought not to be spent by counting over the multitude of witnesses, and as no one had the least doubt, but that all the other fathers had held the same sentiments, which the ten mentioned above had testified to. End of section 31section 32 of the Communitory of St. Vincent Lorin, translated by Rev. J. Shanahan. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter 30. Antiquity is confirmed. Novelty is exploded at Ephesus. The caution of the fathers in handing down to posterity what they received from their predecessors. Presumption of Nestorius, who, like Luther, stood up against the whole Catholic Church. After all these things, we have also added the testimony of Blessed Cyril, which is contained in the very Acts of the Council. For when the Epistle of St. Capriolus, Bishop of Carthage, had been read, in which he intended and sought for nothing else than that after the extirpation of novelty, antiquity should be defended, in this manner Bishop Cyril spoke and defined which it seems not irrelevant to insert in this place. For at the end of the acts of that council he speaks, Let this epistle of the venerable and very religious Capriolus, Bishop of Carthage, whose decision is very manifest, be inserted for a testimony of the acts of this council. For it is his will that the doctrine of the ancient faith be confirmed, and that innovation, superfluously invented and impiously propagated, be reprobated and condemned. All the fathers cry out, These are the sentiments of us all. These we all say. This is the desire of us all. At length, what are the sentiments of all, and what are the desires of all, unless that what has been handed down of old should be held fast, and what lately had been invented should be forthwith exploded? Now since these things we have admired and highly praised, how great the humility and sanctity of that council was, that such a number of bishops, and for nearly the greater part metropolitans, men of such erudition, of such learning, that almost all could dispute upon any question, who as a collective body might have the confidence of attempting and defining anything on their own authority, 
Nevertheless, they innovated nothing, presumed nothing, arrogated nothing to themselves. But they took every care that they should deliver down nothing to posterity but what they received from the fathers. And for the time being, they not only well disposed matters, but likewise gave precedent for posterity in after times, that, for instance, they venerated the doctrines of sacred antiquity, but condemned the inventions of profane novelty. Moreover, we have passed our censure upon the wicked presumption of Nestorius, because he boasted that he himself was the first and only person who understood the Holy Scripture, and that all those fathers were ignorant therein, that before himself all those doctors of the church who had expounded the word of God, that is, all the bishops, all the confessors and martyrs, of whom some explained the law of God, and others of them followed, and believed their expositions thereon, Nestorius, I say, asserted they were all in error, and that the whole church is now and always had been in error, which the church, it seemed to him Nestorius, had followed and would follow ignorant and erroneous doctors. End of section 32 Section 33 of the Communitory of St. Vincent Lorin, translated by Rev. J. Shanahan. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter 31 The Great Authority of Popes Sixtus and Celestinus, Bishops of the Apostolic See at Rome, Their Superiority and Precedence Before All the Other Bishops. Although what has been hitherto treated may be more than sufficiently abundant to overwhelm and smother all profane novelties, nevertheless, lest anything be wanting to such plenitude of proofs, at the end we have added the twofold authority of the Apostolic See, to wit, the one of the Holy Pope Sixtus, the Venerable Personage, who now enlightens the Roman Church, the other of his predecessor, Pope Celestinus, of blessed memory which I have judged necessary to insert here likewise. Therefore, St. Sixtus Pope, in an epistle sent to the Bishop of Antioch, on the case of Nestorius, says, Therefore, because, as the Apostle says, there is but one faith which has evidently prevailed, let us believe what we are to teach, and teach what we are to believe. Then what are those things which we are to believe and to teach? He continues and says, Nothing further, saith he, is lawful for novelty, because it is meet nothing can be added to antiquity. Let the clear faith and belief of our predecessors be disturbed by no mixture of the mire of error. This is indeed apostolically to adorn the belief of predecessors by the light of perspicuity, and describe novel profanities by their mixture of mire. But St. Celestine Pope speaks too in the same style and is of the same sentiments. For he says in an epistle, which he sent to the bishops of the Gauls, reproving their connivance, because they, deserting the ancient faith by their silence, suffered profane novelties to spring up among them. If we favor error by our silence, the fault deservedly lies at our door. Therefore, let such be reproved. Let them be no longer suffered to speak at pleasure. But perhaps someone may hesitate, and ask who those are whom he inhibits from speaking at pleasure their sentiments, whether preachers of ancient doctrines or the inventors of novelty. Let himself speak, let himself dissipate the reader's doubts. For he continues, saith he, If the case be so, that is, if it be so as some persons accuse before me your cities and provinces, because by a baneful dissimulation ye suffer them, to assent to certain innovations, if the case be so, saith he, then let novelty cease from encroaching on antiquity. Therefore, this is the blessed decision of the blessed Celestinus, not that antiquity should cease to overwhelm novelty, but that novelty should not presume to intrude itself upon antiquity. End of section 33. Section 34 of the Communitory of St. Vincent Loren, translated by Rev. J. Shanahan. This LibriVox recording 
is in the public domain. Chapter 32 The Insult Offered to Jesus Christ by Those Who Reject the Decrees of General Councils Heretics Always Reject Antiquity Conclusion Whosoever contravenes these apostolical and Catholic decrees must first insult the memory of Holy Celestinus, who decreed that novelty should cease to encroach on antiquity. In the second place, such a one derides what has been defined by St. Sixtus, who decreed that there should be no room left for novelty, because it is not lawful to add to antiquity. Moreover, he must despise the statutes of Blessed Cyril, who, with great eloquence, paternized the zeal of the venerable Capriolus, because he wished to confirm the ancient tenets of the faith and that novel inventions be condemned. Such a one must also trample underfoot the Council of Ephesus, that is, the decrees of the holy bishops of almost the whole East, to whom the will of God it seemed good to decree that posterity must believe nothing else but what the sanctified and self-conformable antiquity of the Holy Fathers had held fast in Christ, and who even crying out and exclaiming with one voice have testified. These are the expressions of us all. This we all desire. This we all think. That is almost all heretics before Nestorius, despising antiquity and propagating novelty, were justly condemned, so also let Nestorius himself, the author of novelty and the impugner of antiquity, be condemned. If the unanimity of those fathers, inspired by the gift of most holy and heavenly grace, displease any person, what else does he follow unless he sow the profanity of Nestorius, as if not justly condemned? In fine, such a person must also despise the whole Church of Christ and the doctors, his apostles and prophets, but especially the blessed Apostle Paul, as so many off-scourings, the Church, because she never shall withdraw from the religion of the faith once delivered to her, which faith is to be revered and practiced. But him who has written, O Timothy, keep that which is committed to thy trust, avoiding the profane novelties of words, and again, if anyone preach to you a gospel besides that which you have received, let him be anathema. Galatians 1, nine, But if neither the apostolical definitions nor ecclesiastical decrees are to be violated, by which, according to the sacred consent of Catholicity and antiquity, all heretics of all times, and last of all, Pelagius, Celestius, Nestorius, were justly and meritedly anathematized, it is therefore necessary for all Catholics of future times who desire to prove themselves the legitimate children of their mother, the Church, to adhere to the holy faith of the Holy Fathers, to stick to it with the tenacity of glue, and make it the subject of their most serious reflections, and at the same time to detest, abhor, inveigh against, and pursue the profane novelties of profane innovators. These are nearly the subjects which have been discussed more diffusely in these two comminatories but have been somewhat more briefly limited by the law of recapitulating, that my memory, for the strengthening it a little we have compiled these, may be repaired by the daily admonition, and not be overburdened by the surfeit of prolixity. End of section 34. End of the Communitory of St. Vincent Lorin, by Vincent Lorin, translated by Rev. J. Shanahan.